a huge expose in the New York Times has just come out. It offers not a lot of information that we didn't already know, but the details that we're getting now are juicy. I got to tell you, they're juicy. One of the biggest ones out there, though, is that apparently one of the biggest profit centers of the company, no, not Walt Disney World, but Disneyland, when Bob Chapek was CEO, Bob Iger himself volunteered against Gavin Newsom's wishes to shut down Disneyland. Let's talk about one of the biggest financial missteps Bob Bob Iger could ever make here on That Park Place. Hello, I am Jonas J. Campbell, an investigative reporter for That Park Place. And here with me today is Mr. Vash Sky. Vash, you know a lot about theme parks. Just tell me, can you rank for me? What are the theme parks that make the most money? Oh, uh, the theme parks that make the most money. Well, probably Magic Kingdom is going to be number one uh -huh. on that list uh -huh. right there. Yep. Are there any theme parks that are a lot like that, that don't make as much money? Maybe they're a tiny bit smaller? Uh, yes, actually. In fact, I believe there's one, I believe, in Southern California and Anaheim specifically called Disneyland, I believe, is uh, what you're yeah, referring to Yeah, that's in California. Right there. And Gavin Newsom mm -hmm. is the governor of California. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so so this New York Times piece comes out, and, and the timing of it, we're all kind of bewildered at, at, at what happened here, because uh, Alex Sherman, almost a year ago, released a... 12 to 13,000 word, 13,000 word uh, expose on the uh, succession crisis there at Disney. And it was a, it was a great article. And I'm not saying this article is not great, but it does cover a lot of the same material here. Uh, you might call it the live action remake of uh, that article, in fact. Uh, not to say there's not new information because uh, my jaw dropped when I saw this. So let's go over here. By the way, New York Times, this is not in their paywalled section. So uh, we're not using this uh, out of turn here. It's also uh, available on Yahoo for free. Uh, the Palace Coup at the Magic Kingdom, the inside story of how Bob Iger undermined and outmaneuvered Bob Chapek, his chosen successor, and returned power, returned to power at Disney. Uh, okay, so let, let's just point this out here. Very specifically, Bob Iger undermined Bob Chapek. Yes, absolutely. Bob Iger outmaneuvered Bob Chapek. He absolutely did. The public, uh, the public image here is that Bob Iger left in aw shucks and this and that, and Bob Chapek did his own thing, and they begged for Bob Iger to come back against his wishes here because he was gonna he he got a new job out there working for Thrive Capital or something like that, and and he was just he was just gonna hang out on his yacht, but uh, well. Let's just say that uh, that that wasn't exactly the same as the truth. Uh, I, we're going to skip ahead here, but I want to point out the authors of this article, James B. Stewart and Brooks Barnes, uh, both of them New York Times reporters. James B. Stewart is the author of Disney War, which was about the previous Disney succession crisis, not to be confused with the future succession crisis that Bob Iger is uh, set to release in uh, hopefully the next few years. It might get delayed depending on if they have to do CGI or reshoots there. <laughs> uh, Vash, have you read Disney War? You know, I actually haven't read Disney War, uh, but I know many of the many of the details involved with that publication and uh, have tracked that that time of the company's history pretty well. So I'm at least I'm at least familiar with the source material. One could say. Yeah, um, I'll say it's an excellent resource for understanding uh, what happened there. Uh, the Jeffrey Katzenberg, Eisner, uh, Wells uh, situation. And then, of course, Bob Iger eventually right. becoming the next uh, CEO of uh, the Disney company. I know some people who were involved in those events that uh, take issue with some of the uh, they didn't just they, they wouldn't put down to paper what was wrong. But there was a kind of a tongue in cheek. Um, that's not exactly how it happened kind of uh, statement here. But until I know specifically what was uh, incorrect, you, you just kind of have to accept it generally as being correct. We're going to go to a specific section here because this is it, more than 11,000 words. But we're going to go right here to uh, right after. Bob Chapek became the CEO of the company, by the way, announced on February 25th of that year. And here we go to this section titled Iger's Lapdog. Uh, about two weeks later, on March 11th, Mr. Chapek was scheduled to make his formal debut as chief executive at Disney's annual shareholder meeting. Mr. Chapek was nervous, all the more so because public speaking had never been his strength. Before the meeting, Disney's investor relations 
personnel assembled thick briefing binders covering every conceivable data point and question that might arise. Armed with these binders, Mr. Iger and Mr. Chapek settled into the front compartment of the Disney Gulfstream jet for the four and a half hour flight to Raleigh, North Carolina. Sorry, Raleigh. Uh, the site of that year's meeting for which Mr. Chapek expected would be an extended prep session. Several passengers, including Mr. Chapek, recalled that Mr. Iger pulled out his iPad and started flipping through recent photographs, telling stories behind them. There were photos of himself with Paul McCartney, the recent dinner guests in New York. Mr. Chapek said he tried to steer the discussion back to the annual meeting, but Mr. Iger interrupted. Did you see my new yacht design? Charmer here right now. Bob Chapek is, has been given this job very suddenly. He has been yeah. suddenly told. He was originally told he was going to have a, a year of interviews with the, with each individual board member uh, one by one on, on that board member's home turf. So Bob Chapek was going to be traveling around the country doing interviews. And instead, out of the blue, uh, Bob Iger told Susan Arnold, it's Bob Chapek. It must be Bob Chapek. And Bob Chapek, by the way, must report to me, which you find out later that that's actually not copacetic with the uh, corporate bylaws. So we created a nightmare reporting structure where Bob Chapek reported to Bob Iger and the board separately. What a nightmare. Uh, mm. So so he's essentially pushed into this position and he's being prepped for the first, first time he'll be addressing anyone of importance outside of the company. And Bob Iger is over here uh, essentially being an aw shucks, look at my, all my rich stuff that I've accumulated. Yes, and apparently Bob Chapek gets kind of frustrated about this and excuses himself. Now, in the, I believe in the Sherman article, it wasn't really known as to why Chapek I mean, what, did that. I think this article offers just a little bit more clarification on that and also who was in the room at this point, or on the plane, I should say, at this point. And uh, I, I kind of, I mean, if... I don't know, somebody close to Chapek is contributing to this article, which very much I believe that is absolutely the case. I do kind of understand why he would have excused himself at that point, because it, it just seemed that Iger was was more consumed with uh, maybe his own personal wealth, like you said, uh, Jonas, but also, you know, his his goodbye retirement tour and not really about the task at hand, which was uh, w which was, you know, very important, obviously. I'm also going to point out this is the second article in recent memory where Bob Iger has managed to point out that he's best friends or close friends with Paul McCartney. Uh, that's obviously very yes. important to him. No additional comment necessary. Others on the flight said uh, Chapek immediately went to the back of the plane and didn't recall uh, his having any iPad chit chat with uh, Mr. Iger. Uh, Chapek's extended absence was noted in the front cabin. Does Bob want to get briefed or not? Mr. Igar asked his fellow passengers, Miss McCarthy, Miss Mucha, and Mr. Braverman. Uh, finally, Mr. Iger stood up and went to find Mr. Chapek. Bob, do you want to sit with us so we can brief you? Mr. Iger asked. Isn't it all in here? Mr. Chapek replied, holding up the binder. Mr. Iger mm -hmm. said the book couldn't convey the nuances, but Mr. Chapek said he'd review the book and let him know if he had any questions. He went back to his reading. He doesn't want to be prepped. He says the book is enough. An incredulous Mr. Iger told his fellow passengers when he returned to the front compartment, Mr. Iger suddenly felt as if he were at the wedding altar with the bride walking down the aisle. He realized he'd made a terrible mistake, but it was too late. I have to feel like uh, maybe... Bob Chapek got the uh, got got a similar vibe from Iger. Yeah, yeah, that that was really the kind of the the. It, it was definitely the turning point in their relationship. I would think they the article describes them as being very close before this point. They were working kind of hand in glove in order to establish this transition again. Like you said, corporate bylaws being what they are, and there were a couple of of things that maybe should have happened. Like uh, for example, Bob Chapek being interviewed by various board members and so forth. That all didn't take place. Again, they were pretty close at this point, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, two different wavelengths here. Uh, it does definitely feel that, or, or seem, that Chapek was far more business-oriented, while Iger was consumed with, with other things, uh, not just the business. Right, like destroying the business, which is, um, you, you know, I, I wanted to introduce this first because this establishes the the beginning of the adversarial aspect here, because, it, and, and we're going to talk about 
a, a lot of this article. We, we kind of have to figure out how we're going to divide this entire thing up here because some of it is new, some of it is not. Uh, this detail is the one that shocked me. It is apparent early on that Bob Chapek thought that he was the CEO of the company and in charge of the company. And Bob Iger felt like he was in charge of the company and that mm -hmm. Bob Chapek was just there to do all of the things that Bob Iger was no longer interested in doing, but maintaining power there himself. On the way back to California, Governor Gavin Newsom called Mr. Iger before announcing that he would restrict public gatherings in California because of COVID, but he thought Disneyland might stay open. The governor didn't want people to panic, and he feared they might if Disneyland closed. So let's just point out right here, Governor Gavin Newsom, mm -hmm. who is a controversial figure in American politics, at least outside of California. I don't know how the Californians uh, perceive him here. The ones that leave are obviously of a very, very specific feeling about him. Well, particularly around this time, Jonas, very, extremely con controversial. You'll note that because of his decisions made around this time, well, that laid the groundwork for his potential recall campaign. So so around this specific issue, this is probably the most controversial uh, place that Gavin Newsom finds himself in the state of California. Absolutely. Absolutely. But of all of the things that he did and all of the unprecedented power that Gavin Newsom got out there, uh, he wanted Disneyland to remain open. And of course, that would be the CEO's call. So uh, he would naturally get on the phone with the CEO to talk about that. But instead, he called Bob Iger, probably because he had Iger's number in his phone here. Mr. Iger, and I love how they have to say Mr. Iger, Mr. Chapek, because if you say Bob over and over again, it's going to get confusing. Mr. Iger argued to Mr. Newsom that keeping the theme park open was a bad idea, given the health rest of risks to both guests and employees. Mr. Newsom later publicly praised Mr. Iger's advice and cooperation. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that, of course, we would expect from Gavin Newsom. Uh, who was also known for dining at the French Laundry unmasked with all of his friends and mm -hmm. uh, and, and other Hollywood uh, and California elites out there. So he didn't care what the uh, effect would be on people or what the health risks would be to himself. He cared uh, about the public perception here. So Bob Iger uh, took it on himself to say, you know what we're going to do? We are going to shut down, first of all, Disney Plus, not profitable yet. Definitely not profitable. Um, let's see. What else does Disney do? Uh, television kind of yeah. flagging right now. Not 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 what it once was and would now be damaged by streaming uh, yes. here. The only thing that they have that they know that. Oh, by the way, uh, they know that theaters are about to be shut down as well. Yeah. Yep. So uh, in, in a lot of Disneyland also outside uh, theme parks have never been uh, seen as a uh, a place where. The uh, item in question spreads here because a Correct. lot of them are outside. Yep. Of course, they don't know that at this point. But Bob Iger makes the call without talking to Bob Chapek to say, you know what? Our second most the most uh, profitable resort in our most profitable division, we're going to shut that thing down. No worries, yes. Gavin. You, you, you let Bob Iger handle it from here. And remember too, you know, the the, uh, the company was also contending with the big, enormous seventy billion dollar Fox purchase. That is critical to know at this point because remember, Disney is still paying interest, or, or, or and and just interest on the debt from that huge decision by Bob Iger himself. So not only is the company grappling with uh, severe cash flow issues, especially surrounding the loss of Disneyland and that revenue driver, but also too, they they are having to pay down. Uh, their their debts that they had incurred just before this point. So so, I mean I mean JPEG was up against it, uh, in 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 ways that are incalculable to really quantify. You know that's really funny because you bring out the other huge financial mistake that Bob Iger made and and shutting down Disneyland, buying Fox, buying Fox Fox cost seventy billion dollars. Uh, shutting down Disneyland uh, after you have to pay for Fox. It's really a one-two punch here of complete incompetence, incompetence oh, yes. that you're going to do it correctly and really not knowing what you're doing. By the way, that Fox purchase, uh, we s state this all the time. Disney says that was for streaming. 66% of the pro forma assets at Fox were not streaming assets. They were pro forma uh, sorry, on the pro forma, it is uh, linear assets. So uh, mm -hmm. a very good point by uh, Nelson Peltz, 
who had not entered into this as an adversary of Iger, former ally of Ag- Iger, by the way. Uh, mm. Iger decided uh, he wasn't uh, praising him enough here. Essentially pointed out that uh, you say this was for streaming, but 66% mm. of it is linear. So which is it, Bob? Uh, so here we go. Mr. Chapek didn't disagree with the decision to close the parks, but he was furious that Mr. Iger had excluded him. The decision had nothing to do with Mr. Iger's creative mandate. Uh, yeah. So this was, again, the decisions that Bob Iger felt were Bob Iger's decisions he was going to keep to himself. He did not consult Bob Chapek in right. saying that, oh, I'm going to be staying on to do creative decisions here. Again, all of the things that Bob Iger wanted to do, he considered himself the leader of the company, the CEO of the company, and everything mm-hmm. else was left to Mr. Chapek here. Right. Uh, so uh, the the decision to shut down the profit centers of the park, of the uh, company, that was all Bob Iger's doing and had nothing to do with whether or not a movie would be made. Yes, absolutely. This was all Bob Iger's doing right here. And again, this specific decision would lead to enormous ramifications for not just the company, but also the uh, employees directly connected to this resort and to the Parks Division itself. And also the t- the, the city of Anaheim, the a- Anaheim. Here's the thing, Jonas, I did extensive research uh, for this time period because, well, obviously I put out like a 60 tweet thread going into the case on as to why Disneyland should be reopened. This was around uh, the fall of 2020. And so uh, Anaheim put out their own economic report on this. And just to just to underscore the magnitude of the contribution directly from Disneyland Resort actually operating, they were begging and pleading for this place to be reopened Many businesses uh, were destroyed and shuttered because of this one decision right here, and 28,000 employees uh, eventually lost their jobs connected directly to this decision. And the culture of the Disneyland Resort has never been the same. It will never recover, all because of of Iger's insistence that optically the, the company look uh, as forward on this specific issue as possible. I mean, it was just so, so damaging. Now, obviously, Gavin Newsom doubled down, tripled down. I believe there was a plan in the fall of 2020 to get the parks open, but that would have severely restricted how many people or where those people could actually come from. I believe they were trying to limit to um, within a 75 mile radius of the resort or something crazy like that. And then they, you know, uh, Gavin Newsom came up with this color coded chart as to, you know, what would qualify for actually opening. And Disneyland was, you know, on the last of that list based on the qualifications. Iger would then leave the ec- the Economic Recovery Council, I believe, uh, for Gavin Newsom. And uh, obviously there was a big feud there. That was derived between the company and 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 the uh, office of the governor of California. So huge ramifications. Again, Disneyland would be closed for a total of 412 days uh, after this, and and it was just so damaging. It's it's anticipated or or it's at least alleged that it led to about anywhere between five to ten million dollars in losses for uh, uh, revenue per day that this that this resort was closed, that would have put it into the billions uh, mm-hmm. for, for, for how devastating this was. And, and right now, they're still dealing with the consequences of Bob Iger's decisions before Correct. this, and the leverage he was given by the board before this, not counting mm-hmm. the leverage that he was given, sorry, the leeway he was given by the board to hire Chapek uh, immediately. Here's another one here. Disney executives worried about the shock that the park closures would have on the company's right. cash flow. Miss McCarthy and Mr. Chapek made the decision to quickly furlough, albeit with health benefits, more than 90,000 employees at the theme parks. So in dealing with Bob Chap- Bob Iger's decision, they say, OK, well, if we're shutting down the parks, who knows for how long uh, we need to send our employees home? We are going to pay for their health benefits, though. But Iger also, after overruling, the going over said you can't overrule him because he just jumped in the way and said, no, 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 let's shut down the parks. Great idea, Bob. Great idea. After Bob Chapek tries to react to it, and by the way, Christine McCarthy tries to react to it, Bob Iger overrules them and decided to wait until the government passed a COVID relief bill. One more paragraph here before we wrap this up, because I, I got to say, it's just it's it, there's just too much to cover here altogether. 
uh, for one video. Two months earlier, when Mr. Chapek and Mr. Iger had appeared together on CNBC, Mr. Iger brushed aside a question about the potential for confusion over who was in charge. Bob is going to be running the company, Mr. Iger said. That's true. Bob was running the company. Uh, but now it seemed that Mr. Chapek, oh, the other Bob that uh, Bob was acting as though nothing had changed. Mr. Iger was still chief executive in all but name. Uh, Bob's mm -hmm. wife told him he was little more than Bob's lapdog. Was that Chapek's wife that said that? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chapek told him it was a little more than Mr. Iger's lapdog. I used the oh. Bobs there to illustrate, illustrate the ridiculousness of sure. the situation. The once in future Bob, uh, of course. His wife is the one who called Chapek his lapdog, uh, mm -hmm. a kind of a disobedient lapdog there. And uh, and ultimately, that's what got him kicked out. There's also a string of firings in here for all of the people who dared to support Chapek in any way. Uh, this is fascinating to me. And, and, and this is yet another feather in Bob Iger's uh, anti-infinity gauntlet that he's been constructing here. <laughs> My goodness. Vash, what are we going to do about this guy? Oh, nothing, by the way. We can't do anything except just no. tell people what he's been up to. I will say, you know, uh, it's interesting to see how Bob Chapek eventually ended up in the dog house. That's very, that's very interesting. But uh, the beginning of the article notes that Chapek was worried that, uh, you know, Iger was going to be there till the day he dies. And I think he is absolutely accurate because even if Iger leaves, we see his influence is is never ending. There are so many Iger loyalists within the company. His presence is so profound, not just within the company, but within Hollywood and so forth. He'll just never leave Jonas. He'll just never, he'll never not be a part of the Walt Disney Company, even if uh, he doesn't get the uh, corner office with the shower. That's right. The last thing he's going to do, Wet Bandit style from uh, Home Alone 2, he's just going to he's going to going to put a couple of rags in that drain, turn the water on and hit the road on a Friday right before everyone leaves the office and they won't discover it until Monday morning. Well, that being said, uh, let's throw this to our commenters. What do you think about this decision to shut down the most profitable part of, uh, uh, of Disney uh, out there in California? Cause it's definitely not the movie theaters out there. Sorry, the movie uh, studios out there that make any money. Uh, Florida. Well, they, they pretty much kept going uh, down there, shut down a little bit, little bit tiny bit uh but uh as we can see that uh bob Iger can essentially thank governor desantis for keeping that part of the company going uh no matter what uh bob Iger wanted from uh, the governor of that state maybe that's why bob Iger hates governor desantis because uh because bob Iger wanted to be the one to make the decision to shut down the park and governor desantis gave him no excuse what a piece of work anyways like this video if you found it helpful in any way and stay tuned to that park place because we have got a lot to cover on this subject thanks for watching that park place news for more information consider checking out www.thatparkplace.com and don't forget to subscribe, share, like, and send this out on your favorite social media account.